Hello and welcome. Wherever you are listening to this service for Sunday the 22nd of May, a very warm welcome to you as we come together here in St Leonard's Church in St Andrews to share together our faith and worship. From God comes the humility to grasp the wonder of creation. From God comes healing for the brokenness we see. And from God comes the strength to face the challenges of life. And so we come to worship our God, the Creator, God, our Redeemer, God, our Sustainer. Some words drawn from and inspired by Psalm 67, where the psalmist writes, God, show your faithfulness to us, bless us, and make your face smile upon us. For then the whole earth will acknowledge your ways, and all the nations of the earth will know of your power to save. Let us pray. God of light and life, of hope and promise, of every possibility and opportunity. You see all the problems and pains of our world. From those small concerns we carry with us day by day to the deeper anxieties that shadow our lives and keep us awake at night. As we come into the peace of this place, Help us to open our hearts and minds to you, to receive your peace and healing, and to learn how we can bring that same peace and same healing to others. Lord, you give us life, but there are times we don't live life the way you wish us to. When the worries of life have us in their grip, we may give in to the gloom of pessimism. So forgive us when we see only the gloomy downside of situations. Forgive us when circumstances take over and mourning is easier than living. Dark times sap our strength and blind us to your light. So help us to see beyond the darkness, not just a light at the end of the tunnel, but the light that shines in the darkness and that the darkness can never overcome. Help us, Lord, to see your light, the light of Christ. Renew our strength, that we might walk toward that light into Christ's healing light and rekindle your hope in these times. In Jesus' name we ask it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to share with you now two readings from the New Testament. In a moment, from the Gospel of John and from chapter 14, but before that, from the book of Acts, from the Acts of the Apostles and from chapter 16, reading verses 9 to 15. Now, this is an account of part of, one of, 
the journeys, the missionary journeys of Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And it's written from the perspective of one of his companions, Silas. At least that's what we think. And that's why it sounds a bit like a, a letter or an account that you would write to somebody about a journey that you had made. They have plans to go in one direction, but the plans are upset and they find themselves coming to Philippi. And there they have a meeting with a woman. So from Acts chapter 16, verses 9 to 15, let us hear God's word now and let us enjoy God's word together. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samthris, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshipper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen, eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptised, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Amen. And then in John's Gospel, at chapter 14, reading from verses 23 to 27, we hear some very famous words, some very well-known and hugely comforting words of Jesus. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, but do not let them be afraid. For this word of God in Scripture, as for the word of God among us and within us, thanks be to God. Amen. Before today's sermon, before today's reflection, I'd like to read to you a poem. It's a poem by a lady called Jenny Joseph, and the poem is called Warning, and you might recognise it because it has consistently been amongst, voted amongst one of the most popular poems in Britain. It's written from the perspective of a woman, um, and so really it should be a woman who is reading it, so I apologise that it's me. When I am an old woman, I shall wear purple, with a red hat which doesn't go and doesn't suit me. And I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves and satin sandals, and say we've no money for butter. I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired, and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells. 
and run my stick along the public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick the flowers in other people's gardens and learn to spit. You can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausages at a go or only bread and pickle for a week and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. But now we must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the street and set a good example for the children. We must have friends to dinner and read the papers. But maybe I ought to practice a little now. So people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I am old and start to wear purple. Let us pray. Father, may these fragile words be faithful to the written word. It will lead us to your living word, to Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. So, do you ever feel like that? Like sitting down on the pavement when you're tired? Gobbling up samples in the shops, pressing alarm bells? I bet Lydia did. Lydia, in our reading from Acts, is one of the mothers of our faith, one of its many mothers, as well as its first recorded European convert and the founder of the church at Philippi. And according to the passage we read earlier, long before she'd ever heard of Paul, Lydia was a God-fearer. A name given to people who weren't Jewish, but who were so intrigued with the God that the Jews worshipped that they lived their lives as if they were Jews, following most, if not all, of the Jewish laws. So right from the start, we know something important about this woman. We know that she isn't afraid to be different. That she's one of these people who isn't afraid to be unconventional, that she wouldn't have a problem wearing purple and a red hat that doesn't go. She is a God-fearer, a worshipper of God and a dealer in purple. Now an introduction like that may not seem very unconventional to us, but we have to remember that for the writer of the book of Acts to have described a situation where Paul and Silas, two strange men in town, meet a woman, any woman, was in and of itself unconventional. When the Acts of the Apostles was written sometime toward the end of the first century, this sort of encounter would have been considered outrageous. Women and men, especially men who were strangers, simply didn't meet in public. As for Lydia being a dealer in purple, well, people hearing this story in the first century would have been amazed at the very idea of a woman being in business. And then there's the colour purple itself. You perhaps know that it took literally thousands of crushed mollusks, tiny little crustaceans, just to have enough dye to make a yard or two of purple cloth. So this was very expensive stuff, and wearing purple was a statement of status and wealth. It was the Gucci handbag or Rolex watch of the first century, and Lydia is selling purple, and not just purple cloth, but the power of purple. But we're not finished yet, because not only is this woman a worshipper, of God, not only is she a dealer in purple, but with no man on the horizon, Lydia also seems to be the head of her household. An independent woman, a woman of means, a woman of faith. Whatever way you look at her, this is a remarkable woman. 
According to the story, when Paul and his companion Silas arrive in Philippi to proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ, they begin by looking for a synagogue because that's where the people who already believe in God hang out. But to have a synagogue, you need ten men who will meet together to say prayers, and a Philippi, it seems, didn't have ten men, so Philippi had no synagogue. And if there's no synagogue, then any Jews or God-fearers that happen to be in town or passing through, they would know to meet down by the river on the Sabbath day if they wanted to pray. So Paul and Silas head down to the river, hoping to preach the good news to the men, probably, except they find only women. And Acts tells us that they sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. Now a certain woman named Lydia, a worshipper of God, was listening to them. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. We're told that the Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. And then after Paul had finished, Lydia and her whole household were baptised and she invited Paul and Silas to come and stay with her. And many believe that the church that was formed in Philippi, the church to whom Paul addresses his letter to the Philippians, a letter overflowing with hope and joy, this church, this first church in Europe, was in all likelihood founded and led by this woman, this God-fearer a worshipper of God and a dealer in purple. The first European convert to Christianity. This remarkable woman, this independent woman, a woman of means, a woman of faith. This woman named Lydia. And looking back to a time when we've been led to believe convention and tradition demanded that women stay out of the public realm, we see that Paul, who down through the centuries has been branded a misogynist, we see that even Paul promoted the proclamation of the gospel by entering into all sorts of ministries that were actually led by women. And Lydia was one of those women. And it's a reminder, perhaps, how the, from the very beginning, Christianity has flouted convention. How from the very beginning, Christianity has sought to burst the bubble of practice and procedure of habit and custom that can so often, too often, stifle God and God's vision for the world. It's a reminder, perhaps, that Christianity isn't about preserving the status quo. That Christianity isn't about being conventional. Christianity is about challenging that status quo in the world and disrupting the conventional way of living. It's about saying that there is another way, a better way, a more just way, a more loving way to go about the business of life. And so I'm wondering if those of us who call ourselves Christian in the first half of the 21st century need to put away our desire to play it safe. If we need more purple hues in our lives, if we need to dare to step out of our bounds and take some risks to colour outside the lines and not to be afraid to do so. In short, I'm wondering if we need to discover the Lydia within us. In fact, rediscover the Lydia within us and embrace the words of Jenny Joseph's poem that we shared and ask ourselves, regardless of how young or old we are, are we ready to wear purple and a red hat that doesn't go and doesn't suit us? 
Are we ready to make up for all those years of following the rules to go out in our slippers in the rain or pick the flowers in other people's gardens? Are we ready, in other words, to live our faith without compromise? Are we prepared to really open our hearts to God, to share our faith with the people around us, to show them what it means to us? The difference Jesus makes in our life, the freedom our faith gives us, the way it liberates us to be the people that God wants us to be, as it did for Lydia, as it has done for countless millions of lives. Are we willing to share this with people who we have to know are longing for a word of hope, for a message of acceptance, a vision of the future that offers them and the people they love more than just more of the same? So come on. What have we got to lose? Listen to the ways the Spirit of God is moving in you and take a chance and go down by the riverside. Take a chance and dare to wear purple. Because who knows? Perhaps it's when you and I embrace the unconventional of our faith, the freedom to be ourselves in God's love, that we'll not just know, but we'll experience that peace, that promised peace of Christ. And we'll be empowered to share it in ways that will bring joy and life to the world around us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I invite you to close your eyes and to breathe slowly and deeply as we come to God, bringing with us our prayers of intercession, thinking and praying for others. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the hope and healing you bring about in our life, our world. And thank you for using us to bring your light to others. Give us the grace to allow ourselves to be used by the imagination of your spirit in the life of our communities. Where it is needed, Lord, bring hope, bring healing. God of all life and all goodness, we entrust to you those places where all is not well, places where there is deep-seated hatred and mistrust. We pray especially for Jerusalem, for the leaders and people of Israel and Palestine, for the people of Buffalo in America, and for all places where lives have been lost to and are threatened by the brutality of prejudice. We continue to reach out and pray for Ukraine and all countries being bombed and destroyed because of the ideology of other powers and leaders. For all caught up in a turmoil we cannot imagine. For the prisoners and casualties of war. We pray for all those who are victimised for their ethnicity, their religion, their sexuality. For those imprisoned for speaking out and protesting against corruption, for all who speak out for peace and justice, for all who work behind the scenes to bring reconciliation, stability and restraint. We pray for those places where lives are being threatened by the very real effects of climate change, by extreme temperatures, floods and drought, especially in India, in Australia and across East Africa. Pray for places where children are starving, especially in Afghanistan, Yemen and Ethiopia. And we pray too for the hungry children of our own nation. 
We pray for all hospitals, for workplaces, schools and homes, for those under huge pressures, for those who have no job security, for those who are bullied, for those who suffer behind closed doors. And we pray for our church, for all our brothers and sisters in Christ called to live outside the lines, beyond convention, ahead of the curve. And we pray for the communities we and they serve in Jesus' name. We pray for the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. As it meets in Edinburgh, we pray for the discussions, the debates that will take place this week. We pray for the moderator, for Ian Greenshields, praying your grace and guidance to be with him, and with all those who will present reports, and for the commissioners who will make decisions on the behalf of all of the Church of Scotland. May they, Lord, be granted your wisdom, your discernment, and may they be granted your compassion and your understanding. And we pray for one another, for our families, our neighbours and our friends, for all who today feel sad, frightened or alone. Where it is needed, Lord, bring hope and bring healing. And now be with us as we share together the words that Jesus taught, the words of hope and promise that he gave us the words of our Lord's Prayer, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now go in peace, my friends, and may the path that Christ walks to bring justice to our world, to bring light to those who sit in darkness, to bring hope to those who live in despair, and to bring peace to all of God's creation. May this path run through each of our lives, and may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us and all those we love and cherish, today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. Thank you.
Oh, 